Hello everyone, welcome to another fun mathematics video. This time it's episode number 8. And first of all, sorry for not making any videos for quite a long time, I think it's about a year. And the thing is I was quite busy and then my computer system changed and everything, I didn't know how to do them. So there was always some problem. But I would like to thank you for all the support and views I have received on my YouTube channel. I'm quite thankful to that. Actually, I remember when I started making these videos, I was thinking no one is going to watch them. And other people were telling me no one is going to watch this. It's why are you doing this? And then I was quite surprised by how many people wrote me some comments, how, how they like it. So I was thinking yeah, I have to make something, something else. So today we are going to finish our set theory video from, from the before and I would like to call this Cantor's diagonalization method which is I would say one of uh, very genius and, and uh, beautiful ideas I have seen in one of the most genius and beautiful ideas I have seen in mathematics for quite a long time. So this is based on an original proof of Cantor and nowadays it's more, more like a technique of proving that something is impossible. So we are going to, to get to it and also we are going to finish comparing of the sets of, per, of different sizes. So, so we should probably uh, recall what we have done in uh, our set theory video. I don't expect you to remember everything. Of course, it's much better if you go there and uh, watch for every detail. But let me just sketch what we have done. So what we were doing in the second part of the video is that we were comparing different, different sets. And so what we are doing are these basic sets like natural number, integers, and we are going to get also to rationals today and real numbers, complex numbers, maybe something else also. So first of all, you could say that size of all these uh, sets is infinite. Uh, so that's so that's what what we can uh, sort of always say. So where is the point in comparing? How do you want to compare infinity? So this is what was the original video about. So when you want, when you have two sets, a and b, there are two very natural ways how to compare their, si their sizes. So one is you compute compute size of the first one and you compute the size of the other one and you compare these numbers. So we say that A is larger if the size of A is larger and, and so on. This works perfectly when your sets are of finite size but this is not so good for infinities because we do not know how to compare infinities. And there is a way how you can define this, of course, but uh, this is not what we are going to do. So there is a different idea. We can actually compare sizes without knowing them. Without computing them. I think this this is this is very nice. So what we are going to do is we are going to find a matching between elements of one set and elements of the other set. Like suppose that your set A are apples and your set B are bananas. So how we can do it? I have two boxes, A and B, of, of these things. So I can count the number of pieces in one box, count the number of pieces in the other box, and then I can compare them. But I can do it also in a different way, that I will take always one apple and one banana from each box. So I will just like put them as a pair, and then remove them from the box and put them, put them together aside. And then I will take another pair like this, remove them, put them aside and I proceed with this 
so long as I have at least one apple and at least one banana remaining. When I get stuck, what will happen? I either have both boxes empty, and if, uh, sorry, if both boxes are empty, then it just means that I had the same amount of apples as bananas, because I could match them, I could make pairs between them, so they have to be the same. Or it may happen that some apples remain, and then I immediately know that the number of apples is larger than number of bananas, because I still got some apples remaining and no bananas missing, or it could be that some bananas are remaining, and then basically I know that number of bananas was larger than number of apples. So this this is um, a very nice way how we can how we can compare sizes of those sets. The point is that this is working even for sets of infinite sizes. So we say that two sets of infinite sizes are of the same size if there exists a matching between them and if uh, there exists like one-sided matching that I can match elements of one set to elements of uh, partially of the elements one set, but some, some elements of the other set will be mi missing, something like this. Then I say that this, this set is larger than the other. And actually b what, what we proved in the previous video was also theorem of Cantor and Bernstein, which is stating that if one set is smaller than the other, and at the same time the other is smaller than the first one, then it means that these two sets are of the same size. And so so this smaller or equal was was done using using some some injective mappings. So so basically if we have injective mapping one way and the other way, then there exists a bijective mapping. So this is this is what what the statement was about. Okay, so what we were doing before, we were comparing sizes of uh, natural numbers with whole numbers and also with, with some other sets. Uh, let me restate our results from the previous episode in a slightly different setting. So suppose that you have a hotel and the hotel has some uh, number of rooms and all of the rooms are occupied. So I have our rooms and all are occupied. Okay, so suppose that you're a receptionist in such a hotel and then some, some new guest comes and wants some accommodation. So what you're going to do probably is to tell him that you're full and he has to go somewhere else to find some other room. So this seems very clear. I have our rooms, our guests staying in different rooms. There is no possible way how I can make make some uh, space for this new new guest who just arrived. Okay, now, so, now suppose that you have a different hotel. We are mathematicians. So this is some something sometimes called Hilbert's hotel. So suppose that you're, you have infinitely many rooms uh, numbered by all natural numbers. So I have room one and room two and, and so on till infinity. And again, all rooms are occupied. So when a new guest arrives, you will be thinking, yeah, this is the same situation. Everything is full. How I can how I can book him? How I how I can uh, how I can uh, accommodate him? There is no way. But actually, there is a way how you can make a free room. Your guests won't like it probably very much, but it's it's not so difficult. So what you can do is you would like to make a room for this new guest in in room one. So let, let me maybe. Let me remove this thing here. So I have my guest zero who just arrived and then I have guest one staying in room one and guest two staying in room two and 
Let me add a few more. Okay, so I have some setting like this. So what I want to do is I want to put this guest zero to a room one. So to the first room. I decided let's let's put in there. Let's take the guest in room one, guest one, and let's take him out and let's move move guest zero there. It might seem that we didn't have that all, but what we can do, we can take guest one and place him in room two and move guest from room two to room three and move three to four and four to five and so on. So what, what we are going to do, we are going to shift all these guests by one, increase their room number by one, and this is going to make a space for our guest zero. And since we have infinitely many rooms, this this is going to work. We always have one more room for each guest to which we can shift him. In the finite setting, it would not be possible because the last guest staying in room R can be shifted to room R plus one. But in our setting, there is always next room and this is why this works. So what we basically proved by this by this moving of the guests, that the size of natural numbers is the same as size of natural numbers with zero. Because this, this set here is the set of natural numbers, this set here is the set of natural numbers with zero, and we just found a bijection between them, a pairing. This pairing is given by formula x goes to x plus 1. Guest number x goes to room number x plus 1. So um, let's change the setting a little. Suppose that we have infinitely many rooms, again numbered by the natural numbers, and suppose that, on, that not only one guy arrives to the hotel but more people. So if, for example, five guys would come to the hotel, it's, it's very easy, we just do this procedure five times, there's no problem, but what about a bus carrying, it, again, infinitely many people? So again, numbered by natural numbers. So, is it possible to, to book so many people there, or is it, is it not possible? So, one could think that this is not possible, we, we can book one guy, but how, how are we going to make infinitely many rooms free for this guy? But it's again possible, and so we can, we can proceed it differently, we are not going to make one room, but infinitely many rooms. Of course, it's not possible to make the starting segment having infinitely many free rooms, because then where is going guy number one? Nowhere. We cannot move it to infinity. We have to to every we have to assign to every guy in this queue some specific room number. So we have to construct some some bijection like this. But what we can do is that we say okay, so every guest here are the guests again. So on. So every guest is going to move to a room 2x. So we shift our guests to the rooms only of even numbers. So guest 1 is going to go to room 2, guest 2 to room 4, guest 3 to room 6, guest 4 to room 8, and so on. So this certainly assigns to, to every guest, in the, every original guest in our hotel, one free room. And now we have all odd rooms and we can assign them to the new arriving guests in, in the bus. So, so we have these new arriving guests, so let's call them G1 prime, G2 prime, G3 prime and G4 prime and so on. So we are going to match them, to map them into these rooms of 
uh, sorry, into the rooms which are odd. So room 1, room 3, room 5 and room 7 and so on. So this it allows us to, to book all the guests which, which just came. And we don't need any more, any more rooms. What we just proved is that we can find a bijection between the set of even numbers and between the set of whole numbers. And the reason is that basically we can, we can like whole numbers, we can, we can imagine that there, these are, these numbers are non-negative. These numbers here are negative. And we just found a bijection which assigns non-negative number to even numbers and negative numbers to, to odd numbers. So, so also what we proved is that this is the same as set of all even numbers or as size of the set of all odd numbers. So it might not seem so, but all of these sets are of the same size. Okay, so, so this, is, this is what we have done last time, but let's proceed with another set in our list. And this new set are the rational numbers. So it might seem that we get finally stuck here that certainly there has to be much more rational numbers than integers or, or natural numbers. It's, it's not possible, it's not possible that this set would be the same as, as let's say this or, or this and you know it's the same. So we think it's, this is not possible and this is not fully true because it's actually possible, as we will see in a second. So uh, how we can do it? So first we should understand how rational numbers work. So rational numbers are all fractions of type P over Q, where P and Q are, let's say, integers. Maybe let's make our situation easier and let's just prove that all positive rational numbers are of the same cardinality as all integers or uh, natural numbers. So then using this result, it's quite easy, easy to prove, prove this, this thing here. So in this setting, we have all rational numbers of type P over Q where P and Q are are integers. So how we can do it? We can imagine all these numbers as some kind of an infinite table, where here we choose p, here we choose q, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on, on the other axis as well. And then I will write in this table the number p over q. So this is 1 over 1, this is 2 over 1, 3 over 1, 4 over 1, 5 over 1, 6 over 1. Here it's 1 over 2, 2 over 2, 3 over 2, 4 over 2, and so on. This is 1 over 3, 2 over 3, 3 over 3, 4 over 3. Uh, no, let me finish this one. 1 over 4, 2 over 4, 3, uh, 2 over 4, 3 over 4, 4 over 4. So first of all, you can see that this table actually contains more numbers than Q plus. And the reason is that some numbers are repeating. For example, one over one is the same as two over two, three over three, four over four, or maybe one over two is the same as two over four and so on. So, so Every number occurs multiple number of time. It doesn't really matter. And there is a way how to enumerate uh, rational numbers in, uh, in, a, in a way that each rational number appears exactly once, but we are not going to use this uh, because we don't really care. So what, what if, if we prove that this table contains only as many numbers as the set of all natural numbers, then this set is a subset of this table so we can easily show that this set contains less or equal and certainly it has to be equal. So what we are going to show now is that Q plus is actually the size is smaller or equal than the size of all natural numbers. 
but it's easy to see that the natural numbers are contained in this set on the first line. So then we get equality actually by the Cantor Bernstein's theorem. But we don't really care. So, so the first idea could be that, okay, so we go on the first line like this, and when we finish, we go on the second line. Uh, the problem is that we never finish. Uh, because it's going to take infinitely many of the steps and then we don't have any more. So this is this is the this is very similar situation like in our guess here. We have basically two lines of the guests, and from these two lines we wanted to place them. So what we have done, instead of taking one line, placing it and then the other one, we just alternated the lines. So we took one guest from here, one guest two from here, one guest from here, one guest from here, and so on, like this. And then we got all the guests packed in our hotel. So maybe we could do something similar like this. So another try could be, let's take one guest from here like this, and then second guest from here like this, and the third guest from here like this, and the fourth guest from here like this. But this is not going to go work either, because we have infinitely many of the ones, not only two of them as, as before. So we would never get to picking the, the second guest from here. And this is what we need to get to somewhere. Like basically what, what we need is for every guy, let's say some, some guy here, there has to be some f some finite position in, in the line where he gets gets to the hotel. Or basically there has to be a bijection between between N and uh, this this guy, so he has to have some index in this bijection. Basically some 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 uh, order in, in the natural numbers. So so it's not possible to, to do it like that. So Let's come with something else and let's do it that we basically take diagonals of this picture. So let's take this guy here as the first and then these two as second and these three and these four and these five and so on. So we have some enumeration which is which is working using these diagonals. So we have one over one, two over one, one over two, three over one, three over sorry, 2 over 2, 1 over 3, and so on. So maybe let me write one more group here. So 4 over 1, 3 over 2, 2 over 3, 1 over 4, and so on. So I will, I will do all this group. So this is the group number 1. This is the group 2. This is the group, let's say, 3. Uh, let's say this purple one is group number 4. So what we can see is that we are proceeding by groups of the numbers where the quantity p plus q is constant. Because the p plus q here is equal, is equal to 2, p plus q here is equal to 3, p plus q is equal to 4, p plus q is equal to 5, and so on. So we proceed all these positive rational numbers in these groups, and we notice that every group contains only a finite many of the numbers, so we can just pack all these, all these, number, all these groups and all these rational numbers inside of the, of the natural numbers. So, so this, is, this is how we proceed, and we have our bijection, or actually inject, injective mapping, but using Cantor Bernstein we get we get a bunch bijection. So so this is this is our pairing we wanted to do before. Okay, so when we got to this result one might start thinking hey but that just means that all the sets of infinite size are of the same size. There is there is no distinction between them. So we are just showing that all the all the infinite infinite will art sets are of the same size and this is kind of boring do it one by one so maybe we should approach it kind of differently and this is where we get to the original result of Cantor. Cantor's result is stating that the size of the real numbers is strictly larger than size of rational numbers or I would maybe restate it as size of, of integers. It's much easier for us to work with integers. So we are going to show this very surprising result. This might be surprising result for you um, 
it might not sound so surprising, let's say, but for the mathematicians, it was very surprising. But even more, it was it was much more surprising in the in the context that that Q is the in this in this context, it's much more surprising where the set of rational numbers is of the same size as, as integers because. Like when you first hear about real numbers, they don't seem so much different from the from the rationals. So now, basically, what what uh, what one can say is they are a lot different because <laughs> they are of completely different size. This set is really tiny compared to this one, which is much larger. So yeah, but if you, for example, if you have this, uh, I think it's called Dirichlet function. or characteristic function of the set Q that this value X is equal to one if X is rational and zero other otherwise. When you draw this function, what you will see is, is a graph like this, which has just two lines. One line corresponding to X not in Q and the other line corresponding to x in q and so when you see this you <laughs> won't even think this is this is not a graph but this this is this is uh, for every x value there is exactly one function value so but when you draw a picture it will look like this because th there is this um, Archimedean pr uh, this this uh, property that the, the, the density that between between any two numbers here there is one number in between any two numbers here, there is one number in between. And so from the density point of view, they look different, but there is much more points on this red line than on the blue line. Yeah, so so this was this was quite surprising and more surprising results are going to come in I mean a second. So so this is this is uh, I would say a nice nice point to, to really appreciate the result. Okay, so Cantor's result is, is based on a very genius technique called diagonalization method. So, um, how, and it's used in, in many other settings uh, than, than in the setting comparing of sizes. Basically, you, you are doing it in the way that you're proving that something does not exist and you use some way like okay suppose that it exists and am i going to show you that this is wrong that no matter what what uh, what bijection between n and r you constructed this bijection is not correct because there are some integers in r which are not matched to anything in n so I will let you construct whatever you want. You want to show me that I'm wrong and I will anyway show you that you forget something. So so suppose suppose for contradiction that there is a bijection that size of R is same as size of N. So there would be a bijection between these two sets. And so basically this bijection means that we can number all the real numbers R1, R2 up to you know, all the all the natural indexes. We can number, we can number, we can order all real numbers. So let's forget about the all real numbers and only consider the elements in, in this in this interval like this and I and if there is a budget between these two there has to be also a way how to order these these elements here so suppose that that we have even this and I'm going to show you that this is not even possible and this is a subset of real numbers so and this has to be also also true so there is an application like this so so I have of the of all these numbers from 0 to 1 so for every real number, there is some uh, um, some uh, decimal uh, sequence of digits of this number. So every real number ri can be written into form zero point, let's say, one two one one three and so on. Yeah. So what 
we are going to show you that there is at least one number missing on the list. So what we are going to do, we are going to make a table in which on uh, as a rows we place all these numbers so on as you ordered them in your bijection you were claiming you have and then each of these numbers can be written using some decimals decimal expansion so so i have first decimal second decimal third and so on so i can just write in so let's say the first number is pi is zero point and the pi digits so Three one four one five, so on nine two, and uh, this is this is like this, and the second number is let's say one two three one two three one two three, and the third number is zero 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 zero. Maybe maybe all the zeros. This is the zero, and the fourth number is let's say one two six five four two one 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 three, and and we proceed proceed like this so what uh, we are going to do is that we take diagonal of this table and now we use this diagonal to construct some number r not in the list and this number of course belongs to 0 0.1 yeah, so, so this is going to be a contradiction because we claimed we are able to match all these numbers and then we show there is, but there is one, one guy missing in the list, that is in the matching and therefore your matching is, is wrong. So the first idea could be, okay, so suppose that we take just the diagonal which is there, but it could easily happen that there is this diagonal, let's say as R5 or something like this, let's say seven and, and then something proceeding. So this diagonal appears somewhere. So what we're going to do, instead of taking the diagonal directly, we're going to up change it slightly at every position. So from the diagonal, from the, let me denote uh, R, I, uh, comma J, the, Dia the, di the, the jade digit of digit of ri so our diagonal positions are all numbers of form r comma i and now what uh, we can just do is that we construct a number con construct a number x and this number x on the jade digit has something else than R, J, E, J. So instead of taking R, J, J, we take some different number which is going to depend on R, J, J. So if R, J, J is equal zero, we put there one and otherwise we put there zero. So the property is that this number x is different from the diagonal at every position. Yeah, so x digits are different from the diagonal digits. Uh, why I'm choosing it like this? Uh, because basically I want to avoid numbers having all nines in the end, because if you have a number, which is let's say three, one, two, and then all nines like this, then this is exactly number 3.13, not all the nines sum to one. So, so I want to avoid this, so my number x is certainly, certainly well defined, but we could also like forbid to have infinity, and we should probably forbid to, uh, of having infinitely many digits in our table. Because th there is always another form of the number we prefer if there are infinitely many of digits. But now what I claim is that the number x is nowhere in the table. And suppose that I'm wrong. Let's say number r1000 would be x. And let's say, why not? We don't know what is the number 1000. Why, why can claim it's not x? But the problem is that this diagonal extends somewhere. So I have the 
are 1000, 1000, this digit, and I change it. I know that no matter what was there, I took something else in my X as the 1000 digit. So, no, we say no, this is not, not correct. It's different from this number. And it's different from every number in this table, no matter which I take. Always it's different on this diagonal position. So, no matter what you do, X is not in your table. In your table is wrong. So this is the this is the Cantor's diagonalization table. And we get contradiction with our assumption. Yeah, that, uh, that basically there was a bijection. So we know there is no bijection and therefore the size of R has to be larger than size of N. Yeah, because there is, there is injective mapping from the other way, of course. It's a subset. Okay, so, so this is this is the Cantor's diagonalization method, the original proof. And I would say it's really beautiful, beautiful idea because using using this this di diagonal visit, basically what you do is that you construct a number which differs from every number in your list, and for every number you use a different position. So using this infinitely many of the positions, you can just go and construct construct a bad guy which is different from everyone. So we got we got uh, our main result for today, but let's look slightly more for the for the other sets and maybe let's show some some other examples of this so one thing there uh, we can we can surely state that suppose that you have some set a and you take let's say and you take power set of this set so this is set of all sets y such that y is subset of a so if let's say if a is 0 1 and 2 then your set 2 to a contains all the set it contains what it contains empty set then it contains the singletons then it contains all pairs And finally, it contains all the elements, so the A itself is contained there. So what we can see in the, in the finite setting is that this set is smaller than this this guy here because we have uh, this has two. This, if this has n elements, this has two to n elements. elements like this and so we might be thinking that there might be something like this true that size of a is always smaller than size of its power set or potence set there are different names for for this because this is appearing a lot in areas of mathematics like combinatorics so we might believe in this, and this is actually true, and we can prove it easily using Cantor's diagonalization method. So again, for contradiction, yeah, we can say that suppose that A is equal B, because immediately we know that A is less or equal to, to A, because there is certainly an injective mapping from A to A to this guy, because we can just take the singletons and map the elements of this to singletons. So we certainly know this. So suppose that A would be, sorry, not, not B here, 2 to A. So what we can do, we can, num we can number the uh, elements in 2 to A using the elements in A. So we can make some similar table. We can basically, we suppose that A can be somehow ordered in this table. And if we want to do it slightly formally, it would take uh, a while, but the idea should be clear. So basically we have our elements A1, A2, A3, and so on. Um, maybe let's, uh, let me denote element, elements here, sorry, by B, not by A. So we have elements B1, B2, 
and so on. So, uh, and suppose that, uh, that uh, this is the numbering I obtain using this bijection. So, so I've already numbered them b1, b2, b3, and so on. And now I make a table which contains the elements of my my set A, A1, A2, A3, E4, A5. So I'm assuming that there is some numbering of them, but um, let's say let's say there is, there is a well-known, uh, quite very strong axiom called axiom of well ordering, which is stating no matter what is your set, you can always order it. And without it, it's pretty much impossible to to work with something like like very large infinite sets. So what I can do is that I can write in these tables some code which describe what, what is UBI. So I can write either zero or one. Zero codes that the element A, if I write on a position A, B, J, A, I, the position of my table, let me denote this table T, is either zero or one if AI is not in BJ, I put zero. If AI is in BJ, I put one. So I, this is some kind of binary coding of, of what are my subsets. So let's say this contains one, one, zero, one, zero, one, one. This contains, let's say, zero, zero, one, one. Zero. One zero zero one. This is one one zero one 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 one, and so on. So something like this. So again, we do the same trick. We just use the diagonal here, and we take the all the elements on the diagonal and we flip them. So if the element w was contained in uh, in the on the diagonal, we say it's not there. So we construct some new B contained in 22a, which is defined that a i lies in b if and only if a i is not contained in b i. And now this certainly is an element from the power set and it cannot be any of, of these elements here because if it would be some b b i then this is a, B is different from BI because BI, BI is, is different on, on, on AI. So, so B is different from BI for every I. And the reason is that uh, basically BI contains AI if and only if B is not containing AI. This is exactly what, what's written actually here. So uh, this B is different from all of these elements here. For each uh, for each element here, I am using using one index, one specific index, and this index is AI. Now, actually, if you don't even need to make a table because you can just you can just define it. If you have a bijection like this, I'm going to construct a new element which is not mapped to anything. So I can just I could I could forget about this this table here. This this table I have I have the here. I could forget about it. I could write this formula like like it's here. Now I have the bijection between AI and BI, and then I could construct B using this, and this B would not be match to anything but I, th I think it's really important if you if you just show this proof to really show this table because this is what uh, the idea is behind this is this table nothing else and without the table it's not very understandable okay so so this is this is one example and if there is more time we can, we can show one more but maybe not not uh, in this in this video but what we can do is we can consider continue with our table. So let's take complex numbers. So are complex numbers larger than real numbers? It's you have one more something like one more dimension, one one more direction, or or if you don't want to talk about real uh, complex numbers, we actually don't need that they are complex. You can just use uh, the number of elements in in a plane. So two two dimensional vector space of real numbers. So is it larger than real numbers or not? So one would be thinking 
Yes, of course, because like one is just line and the other is plane, so plane has to be larger than line. There are some, some geometrical arguments why, why this has to be true, that the line contains much less of the points, because I have like this line and uh, many, ma infinitely many of the lines, and so, so there has to be more of them. And again, we would be wrong. This is not true. And this, this is the result which shocked everyone. When Cantor presented this, people were claiming that his results are like stupid because uh, they allow to, to come with, with uh, results like this. His, his definitions are stupid, his set theory is stupid. Because basically everyone was thinking that there is some dimension, we can use some dimensional argument which allows us to say what's larger or what's more. And then in the Cantor's set theory, this was not possible. So this was really shocking for everyone and people were just thinking that Cantor is some uh, crazy guy and uh, didn't took him seriously and it, it took quite a long time before his, his results were acknowledged by, by people. It was, I think, uh, long after his death. death. So, so it's kind of kind of sad, sad story of his. So uh, what we can do here is present a very simple bijection. So suppose that we have a number, we have a po point at coordinates x and y in r square. Uh, instead of r square, I'm going to show that it's possible to find a bijection between closed interval closed or partially open, one side closed, one side open, 0, 1. So this this interval here. And between a square, which has, uh, again, partially open boundary, but it's not really, really so important. So we have this, this part here is open and this, this is closed. So, so we want to find a bijection between this uh, 0 0.1 squared and we want to we want to map it bijectively to this to this interval of of flanked one. So there exists bijection. This is this is this is what what we claim. So so our result is is then di direct corollary of of that. And these two sets are of the same size. So what we do is again we assume that x and y we have some some decimal expansion of these two numbers. And we suppose that it does not contain an infinite progression of, of, uh, of nines. If it does, then we take another form of, the, of this. Okay, so, so what, what we do is that basically out of x and y, we're going to construct z, which belongs to 0, 1. And we are going basically pack the digits of x and y into one number z. How we do it? So, so suppose that we have z, the, that x is equal to 0, 0.x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on. y is equal to 0. Point, I should probably write not the Czech version, but the, the, the English version, the dots there. y1, y2, y3, y4, and so on. So how I do it, my number z is basically going to take these digits and just alternate them. So my number z is just taking x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, x4, y4, and so on and so on. Yeah. And so basically we are able to pack these two numbers, this x and y, into just one real number z, like this. And this is a bijection, because for every number z, I get two numbers x and y, and uh, for every x and y, I get, I get, um, I get one number z. Uh, this is actually not fully correct because my number z could be, let's say, 0 0.09090909090 and so on. And then my number x 
would be 0 0.999 which is 1 which is outside of the interval and y is uh, 0 uh, so this is this is not actually bijection this is again an injective uh, mapping mapping of the pairs into z but that's pretty much what we need because then we can again use Cantor's Benstein theorem and this is this is just really really some tiny technicality but it doesn't change the, the truth of the statement which uh, which is what what should be with, with really good mathematics that it really does not depends depends on, on technical details important are ideas yeah if if your results are really depending on some technicalities there there might be something wrong with your definitions i would say yeah you need you need to basically change the way how you view things or something like this yeah so so this was this was very very surprising for everyone because they were really, they were really this was the, the era of of geometry and geometry has a really huge influence on mathematics and now people were thinking but wait a second there are things which we don't understand anymore and it is a really big problem with, with all these all these infinities that there are are things which might seem counterintuitive let me show you one more example. So uh, suppose that uh, so what what we have seen is that if uh, if n is or omega is set of of natural numbers, then we can take power sets of this two to omega, which is actually real numbers, or uh, real numbers have some some additional operations this time, but like you can find a bijection between these two these can be understood as zero one progressions of i have uh, zero one one zero and so on these elements like this so so i can basically pack the decimal decimal expansions of the real numbers into these these binary progressions or, or if you don't like to you can you can use uh, the decimals here and this is pretty much the same because i can i can pack them them in between i can use for for every every uh, element of the progression i can use like uh, four elements here and, and uh, find find some injective or bijective mappings between these these things so they are of the same cardinality of course but then what people are studying quite a lot are also in, in analysis are functions real number functions which take real numbers and map them let's say to real numbers so how many of these functions we have so we have two to omega and two two to omega again uh, the reason is that the number of functions from a to b the number of these things of different things is uh how much so for every element of a i have b options how to assign it so it's size of b powered to size of a so and basically if you want to define what is what is this thing then then in a set theory what you do is actually you take a set of all mappings from a to b and you just take cardinality of this mapping so this is actually a definition of this symbol here and this is the reason why why everything everything makes sense and also the reason why for example the zero has to be empty set because if it would contain something then this this type of formula would not work for uh for uh, integers or for natural numbers so we want this formula to be to be working for natural numbers as, as we know it so we have this amount of um this amount of uh, functions and that's uh, quite quite a lot of functions if you think about it because it's real to real so it's uh, like 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 quite quite a lot of things but uh, there there is a well-known property that the function is continuous continuous uh, i think it's written like this so Continuity is some very basic property in analysis. It's basically stating, as, as in I was talking about it, I think in the uh, in the sixth episode, uh, continuity is sh saying that a function is not changing the values too rapidly. So, if I if 
my error around if I have some point on the function point x and if I look around this point the, the change of the value is not too large and of course the range rate can change for different x's but, but if, if I get very close to x then the change will be very small so so this is this is this is how how you should you should probably remember what what continuous means so how many of the continuous functions we have and we will see that the number of the continuous functions of these curves uh, which have continuous graphs uh, this these types of objects it's much smaller than the number of all functions so how to do it so there is a property which is stating that uh, continuous functions functions are uniquely determined by values on a something called the dense set on dense uh, on a dense set um, so so what does it mean suppose that I have a I know the value of any function on some very large or very uh, of a, on a set of very nice properties so I have some unknown function f but I know fx for all x in my set s so then the function is of course not uniquely determined because I can extend the remaining values as I want unless the set S is all the, are all the real numbers then I don't know anything okay so but this is not true in the sense of continuous functions then set means that uh, if I take any y in real numbers There exists something arbitrarily close, really close in S. So it means that if I have my Y here and I get arbitrarily close to X, close to X, I just always find something, some, some X in S. And if I get even closer, then I again find something some y, uh, some x2 in s, and so on. So no matter how close I get, I can't avoid the numbers in this dense set. So if I have a dense set, and I know the function, the function is fully determined for every x in s, then the, fu the continuous function is uh, uniquely determined by that. Yeah, because suppose that there will be two possible extensions, f1 and f2, and they are different like this so it means that f1 y is different from f2 y yeah, so so there has to be some for some some index y in real numbers so i have basically two functions let's say like this this is this is let's say f1 and this is f2 and these two number these two functions are different on this y coordinate here so what I'm going to do is that I can take some arbitrary small neighborhood. I see actually it cannot be like this because this arbitrary small neighborhood contains something from S. But then with my knowledge is that the, the function has to be the same. So the functions have to be actually different. I, can, I have to redraw it. It has to be something like, let's say this. But now what I can do, I can take even a smaller neighborhood and again there is some value and the functions have to be actually like this, something like this. But as I get closer and closer to the value y, then the cha then because the values have to be on, on, the, on some point inside a smaller and smaller neighborhood of y they have to be the same, then the functions are changing the values more and more rapidly, which is not possible since the functions are continuous. So it's not possible to, to basically make this, this gap here. This gap, no matter how small this is, 
then it's too arch. It, the both of the functions can't be continuous. So so this is this is how you how you do it. So now what we what we know is that we if we determine on a sum dense set, then there are only only so many continuous functions as continuous functions from this dense set to real. So as our dense set, we can just use rational numbers. They are clearly dense. This is this is one of the basic properties of them. There and then I know that if I have a function which is from Q to R, then this function can be uniquely extended to the to a continuous function on reals. So there is the same amount of these functions and continuous as the continuous function on reals. So how many of the continuous functions we have? So for every element in Q, we define we select one element in R. So we have only two two omega for every element I select one element in R, and I select it omega times. So this is two omega. So this is much much less than two two omega two two omega, like this. And uh, yeah, so 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 basically. Um, Basically, basically, this is this is what we know. Yeah. And uh, so, so again, we can see that that one of the one of the very very use terms, continuous functions, and in most of the theorems we assume continuity. This is not what uh, most of the functions are, because most of the functions are non-continuous. Yeah. So. So this is this is this is one of the thing one, one one should be aware when when he's using, uh, when he's using analysis. On the other hand, most of the functions are continuous almost everywhere. So like most of the functions we mostly work with. So so these are some some very strange counter examples which we know that there are plenty of them because we can just count their quantity, but we do not construct them. We do not show them explicitly. So so this is this is type of the existential. Argument. Yeah, basically what we do instead of um, counting the things, we just uh, show that uh, one set is larger without like showing directly how how it works or uh, what what are the additional elements in the in the set. We do not understand it that that well. But on the other hand, it's a very easy argument how to show that something is larger than the other. Okay, so. Uh, so maybe let me finish this um, this uh, video by talking about um, some different thing, and this is continuum hypothesis. Sometimes dealing with CH. So this was a problem. Uh, Cantor was working for a very long time and the story is quite sad because he basically got crazy from working on this problem he he will he will he got crazy and then then he died in uh, some uh, healthcare facility and uh, he was not able, able to like basically do do any work anymore and he was struggling with this problem for a very very long time and <laughs> He never succeeded in working on this, and this was what was really destroying him, because for years he didn't knew what was the answer to this question. And this is one thing you should never do: if you work on something for too long time, then you should probably take a break and start working on something else, because maybe by that you're going to solve it. But if you just sit on one problem and try to solve it all, all with all your powers, then then you might get nowhere, and it's not really going to help you in. I mean, physically, so, so, uh, so, what was this problem? This problem is some kind of very natural question to things we showed today. So we basically showed that real numbers, or that rational numbers, or integers are of the same size, and that they are of smaller size than the real numbers. So when you see something like this, there is an immediate question. Is there 
something in between. Now, or in other words, is there something in between omega and 2 to omega? Again, the, the, same, the same question. Is something in between? It's a very natural question. So Cantor was working on this hypothesis and he never knew whether it's true or not. So how it worked for him? So he was working sometime and he proved that the continuum hypothesis is, let's say, true. So he wrote it down, sent a letter to his publisher, and then after a while he, he found a mistake in his proof. So he was working on this mistake and he found out that actually the continuum hypothesis is false. So then he wrote it down, he sent it, and another week he discovered another mistake, which then changed that the result is true. And then he was going like this, always changing his uh, his understanding of the continuum hypothesis in his head, it was always changing, and he was not not certain about anything. And then then he yeah, he basically got crazy out of this. So. Nowadays, the, the continuum hypothesis is solved in somewhat, somewhat nice, nice, uh, nice way. Or I'm, it's not not so easy to state whether it's true or false because, in some sense, it's actually neither. Uh, so there is no wonder that Cantor couldn't prove it, prove that it's true or false because it's not possible to prove it. So how does it how does it work? So you you can assume that continuum hypothesis is true. You can assume that it is it is wrong false and you can never prove any of these so there are two results one is uh, through ghetto uh, I don't remember the year but basically what he proved that if you assume that CH is true then you get no contradiction with axioms of set theory so you you can add another axiom which is stating ch is true there is no set in between and then you wouldn't get any new problem which you didn't have before so you might assume it's true but still when when he proved this 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 problem it was not not solved yet because it, it might happen that if you would assume that continuum hypothesis is false you would get a contradiction which would which would allow you to to say that it has to be true because there is always either true or false in, in how the logic is built so if if false would make you something bad would make something bad in the set theory you could say it's true but then much later cohen proved using uh, some technique called forcing that you can also assume that for that it's false and again you have no contradiction yeah, so exactly the same result you can decide whether it's true or whether it's false and you won't be wrong you won't make a prob it won't make you any problems with, with your set theory so in some sense it's stating Okay, you can assume that the continuum hypothesis is true, but you can never prove it. There is no proof which was stating that the continuum hypothesis is true. You just have to ha make it as your assumption and that's it. So, suppose that continuum hypothesis is false, then you know what? There exists some set X in between. So, there exists a set X such that the size of x is between size of rational and real numbers. How does it look like? How does it look? You can't never you can never know. Because even though you assume that such an x exists, you can never construct x.
Because if you would be able to construct X, then you would be able to prove that continuum hypothesis is false and you can never achieve this. So this is not possible. So you can assume existence of this object in between, but it's not going to help you to, to know how, how, does it, how does it look. <laughs> this is this is completely crazy if you think about it, but this is this is how, how mathematical logic works, that there are some statements which are undecide undecidable and with the certainty you know that you will never be able to prove of, prove them. And actually there are even more crazy things because there are also statements for which you know that the, there might be undecidable and you will be never able to prove whether they are decidable or not. We are just lucky here, but it might happen that we will never know. And this is, this is, I would say, a rather crazy idea. And it's, it's really somehow stating you that you will, you will never know what is the truth of some, some of the statements. Yeah. So, yeah, I, th I think this, this, this is a nice, nice point here to, to, to finish finish this uh, today's video but i, th I think we, we learned uh, quite a lot of stuff so first we have learned how to compare set sizes even when the sizes are infinite and we have seen how to show that the, the real numbers are larger than rational numbers which is one of the very neat tricks due to cantor and then we have also seen some another rather surprising results in, in geometry or or this this continuum hypothesis which which is one of the one of the very very fundamental mathematical problems of past i think there there is still, still some work uh, ongoing on on this problem and not 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 much is is known known on on for example some some nice uh, axiom systems in which the continuum hypothesis would be false or or things like this so people just don't know how to how to make something where, where this would be natural uh, unless you you say continuum hypothesis is false this which is a rather very weak axiom because it, you cannot use it to build anything yeah so so thanks for watching and maybe try to not not think much about these things because you don't want to to end up the same as, as Cantor did okay so see you guys and if you want a video on some specific topic maybe feel free to to write me in comments or in, in uh, send me a message and then I will think whether I can I can do something like this bye bye